All right, uh, let me uh, uh, welcome you to this class, which is a course uh, on uh, contemporary Indian cinema and uh, nationalism. Uh, contemporary Indian cinema is usually known by the word Bollywood, but one of the things you're going to find out as we move along is that the two are actually not uh, synonymous. Uh, but that's uh, a subject for greater discussion at a later point in the course when you have a bit more knowledge about Yeah, I, I mean, it looks okay to me, but did you get it back? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. It's on now? All right. Good. Okay. So, all right. So, so uh, let, let me take some time to uh, kind of give you a, a, an overview of the course. Um, so, what we're going to do today, we'll have a full class. I'm going to give you a brief overview of the course, and then I'm going to uh, go over the uh, requirements for the course. Uh, and uh, and then uh, take the second half of uh, uh, the afternoon today to basically uh, give you a more detailed um, you know uh, analysis of uh, the kinds of questions that we're going to consider uh, in this course uh, and the nature of the syllabus right so that's pretty much what the agenda will be for for today so uh, the first thing is that this is a course which lies at the intersection of history and cinema. I cannot emphasize that enough. It's, it's obviously a course uh, taught under the auspices of the history department. Uh, and therefore, what you should expect is that we're really going to be looking at a subject. In this case, we're going to be looking at Indian nationalism. Uh, and we want to try to understand what role cinema has, placed, uh, has played uh, in the uh, representation of Indian nationalism and the understanding of Indian nationalism. Uh, what is the relationship, for example, between the text and the image? Right? So, you know what the old phrase was for cinema? Um, it was basically the moving image. That's, there are actually a number of museums around the world and they're, which have to do with cinema and they're very often called museum of the moving image as opposed to an image that is still. Whether, in fact, actually an uh, image on a paper is ever still, except in some mechanical sense, is something that we'd obviously have to think about as well. Uh, and not everything that moves really moves, I want to argue. Uh, there, can be, there can be something static uh, in something that appears to be dynamic, and there may be something actually quite dynamic in something that appears to be static. Uh, for example, there's a film which very much has to do not with Indian nationalism, it has to do with Australia. I recommend it very highly. It's called Breaker Morant, uh, M-O-R-A-N-T, Breaker Morant. So this is a man called Morant. He was a breaker of horses. Uh, so that's why he was called Breaker Morant. Uh, it's an extraordinary film made about 30 years ago. Uh, and what's very interesting is that half the film is, takes place in a courtroom. So the, the camera doesn't move very much. Uh, because it's within that limited space where at most it moves from the defendant uh, to maybe the prosecutor and maybe back to the defendant uh, and then it moves to things that he's talking about but the courtroom dynamic itself creates a tension which is as great as any tension outside the courtroom and there you see where a camera is quite static it's basically just focused on him for two three minutes it's still tension filled right so uh, I think that we should avoid this cliched idea that that the, that the film is a, you know a, a set of moving images. Yes, it is, uh, because one frame moves after another. All right, but 
of course, merely because it moves, it doesn't mean, as I said, that it creates a dynamism. All right? However, the key thing is this, that what we're interested in is a historical interpretation of the phenomenon of nationalism. But in this course, we shall try to understand how we might arrive at that interpretation through cinema. All right? So that's the, that's the nexus between history and cinema. Uh, which is another way of saying that this is not really a course in formal film criticism. You know, there is a field of studies, of course, called film studies. And when people do film studies, they are interested for good reasons in such things as the form of cinema. What is a form of cinema? How do we distinguish between one film and another kind of film? Uh, what is the role of editing or montage? Why is it that some kind of editing may be more productive in creating a certain image than another form of editing? What is a maison en scène? What is the background? So forth and so on. All right? So if you were doing formal film criticism and you were coming to the subject from film studies, you would be really looking at lots of questions that, let's say, a historian may not be looking at. Because for a historian, film might be just yet another kind of narrative. We know that historians work with narratives. Right? So, we, so, we, so cinema could certainly be viewed as another kind of narrative. And what I'm trying to suggest to you here is that if you are coming from, let's say, a film studies background, I don't think really anyone is, but if you were coming from a film studies background, you may be interested in certain kinds of questions that this, qu this course may not really take up. We are interested in questions having to do with camera angle, for example, sometimes, because sometimes that cam camera angle may give you a certain view of a matter which you may not get otherwise, you know? Uh, and so the, one of the first readings that you're going to be doing uh, for this course is you're going to read a very short book that I wrote on one single Hindi film. Uh, this film is a film that is widely known in India. Uh, there are some dialogues of it which have been parodied to such an extent that I can't even begin to give you the history of the way in which a few dialogues from this film have been parodied. It's a film made in 1975 called Divar. Divar means the wall. Um, it has uh, the person who is known as the uh, superhero of Indian cinema, Amitabh Bachchan, in one of his major roles. Uh, another role was played by a man called Shashi Kapoor who just died a short while ago. All right, so uh, uh, I, uh, I wrote a whole book on this one single film, and the reason you're reading that is partly because it has a bearing on the subject, of course, but also because it's a book about how to read a film. How does one actually read a film? How does one interpret a film? And there you will see that even though I'm not coming from a formal film studies background, I do talk about such things as camera angles, what happens when the camera <laughs> zooms in as opposed to zooming out. All right? And why is the director doing that? What is he telling us uh, when he undertakes such a shot? All right? So uh, the gist of it is, again, to go back to where I started from, that this is a course that lies at the intersection of history and cinema. Secondly, our main concern is now Indian nationalism. And, so, and, and later on, I will give you a short uh, uh, narrative of that, particularly uh, the second lecture. Um, I, I want to add a little footnote here. I hope you've seen the syllabus very carefully, but there's no class on Thursday. Uh, you know, I'd mentioned that on the syllabus, so my second lecture actually will be the Tuesday of next week. Uh, and in that class, I'm going to basically take up the whole time to give you the background to Indian nationalism. You know, the emergence of Indian nationalism, its history beginning in the late 19th century and moving to the first half of the 20th century. Uh, because my assumption is that, you know, you're not really coming from a background uh, within, uh, you know, of a study of Indian history or a study of, let's say, the British Empire uh, and what was transpiring. I mean, some of you may have a vague idea, but I want to obviously ensure that you have at least a, uh, a narrative account of Indian nationalism. And then, of course, each of the films that we take up in turn will probe certain questions in much greater detail, right? Uh, for each week, generally, there is a film that is paired with the readings. So that's how you should look at it, that there's a film, and then there is a set of readings that kind of 
you know, go along with that. That doesn't mean that these readings necessarily speak to that film. They may or may not. Uh, but but it, let's supposing uh, there is a person called Bhagat Singh, uh, just as an illustration. So let's supposing that you know our our session is going to be devoted to him. So then obviously what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you uh, a set of readings which have to do with uh, Bhagat Singh and uh, how one might understand his place in Indian history, what kind of uh, legends grew up around him. Uh, there are some historians who take the view that we have to sort the legend out from the fact. I don't think that's a very interesting way to do it, frankly, because uh, sometimes legends are much more interesting than the facts. Uh, and people conjure up all kinds of things based on legends, you know. So I don't think that, you know, we're necessarily interested in, when we do a session on Bhagat Singh, you know, you're not going to get the real Bhagat Singh, so to speak. What you're going to get is an understanding of what are the representations of Bhagat Singh in Indian culture and what role did cinema play and what is the relationship between cinema and other forms of representation. Right? So I think that gives you a sense of how we're going to really uh, tackle our subject. All right? Now, um, let me move from here to some um, administrative matters, if I may put it this way. All right? Um, the first has to do with the readings uh, and uh, how you would access the readings. For, so for those of you who are registered for the course, uh, uh, all you have to do is really just log in with your Bruin online and go to the course website and you'll see something called syllabus with links and you go to the syllabus with links uh, and 95% of the readings are already linked. If anyone has actually gone to the website, you would have seen that. Uh, there is my book. I had sent out an email to the entire class uh, uh, maybe about a week ago. For those of you who registered only a day or two before, you would have gotten it, but it doesn't really matter. But what I did mention was that the book, my own book, Devar, I did not order it for you at the bookstore, but you can, you can go to Amazon or you, you know, the vendor of your choice, and you can easily find used copies, new copies, for much cheaper than what the bookstore would have. Uh, and you can also find, uh, uh, get it on Kindle. Uh, that's, the, that's the most uh, expedient way, the quickest way, obviously, to have the text uh, in a couple of minutes is just to get a Kindle copy if you would rather do that. All right? Uh, but you should read that book. Uh, and let me say, before I forget, uh, this is really quite crucial, uh, you have to watch the films. If you're not interested in watching the films, you're not really going to get much out of the course. All right, you have to watch the films, and preferably you should watch the film before you come to class. So we're going to have a discussion about that film. Unlike most traditional <coughs> lecture courses, there will be more discussion in this one than there would be in a traditional lecture course. Because if I'm going to see a film, uh, you know, a film is something that everybody thinks they're an authority on. Uh, by which I mean that, you know, you go see a film, you always have an opinion about it, right? I mean, you might have gone to a film with five friends and you come out arguing about the film and everybody thinks their view is fairly solid. Uh, because, of course, somehow we don't think that films really are texts in the same fashion and that everybody uh, can have an opinion. And indeed, everybody can, but not all opinions are equal, needless to say. Uh, you know, some opinions are based on a bit more substantial reading of that particular phenomenon or that particular film in this case. Right? So uh, what would be most productive for you as you take this class is to ensure that you see the films. Um, and one of the things that you will have to do is you'll have to keep a journal. I'm going to get to that in a moment. So that will, I think, uh, be one way of ensuring that you really do see a film or a part of it in any case. But naturally, the best thing to do is to watch the whole film. Um, uh, and mind you, all of these films, I think, are actually extraordinarily interesting. You know? All right, so I, I picked them quite carefully uh, because I think they all are compelling in their own fashion. All right. Now, uh, going back to the question of reading, so I've already mentioned that my own book, you should just acquire it immediately so that you can start reading it uh, in time for next week. Uh, and. Uh, uh, the other readings, uh, there's, no, there's no other book for the course. They're all available online. The readings are linked. Now, a word about the films. You should be able to access all the films through the UCLA course website. 
So there is, if you go to the, if you go to the, uh, once you have logged in, you get a column on the left hand side uh, and you scroll down to the bottom of that. So it says syllabus with links, week one, week two, week three. You just scroll down to the bottom and then it'll say media resources or video. You click that. When you click that, you will get a list of all the films, okay, that have now been digitized for your viewing pleasure. All right? So all you need to do is you click on that and you'll be able to see the film. These films are available to you until the end of the quarter. You can try doing this from your own home if you're not on campus. Um, but generally what happens is when you try to log in, you'll have to use a VPN network. So, okay, you, without VPN you won't be able to do it. But once you have that, if you don't already have that install it, just install it. But very often there'll be problems with the transmission. It's not that good. The reception is much better if you are viewing the film from campus computer. All right. Some of these films are on YouTube. I think you should go to the UCLA website, try to access it from there, because sometimes the YouTube versions uh, have been truncated or edited in some fashion. Some of them don't have subtitles. Uh, if you don't know Hindi Urdu, uh, you're going to have a problem. Uh, uh, you know, if you don't have subtitles, because you will need them, obviously. So the films that have been digitized for your use all have subtitles, all right? And that's really the best way to watch them. Uh, there are a couple of them that you might be able to get through uh, streaming from Netflix, possibly. You know, so you can try all kinds of things if you want, but really, there's no need to. Uh, you, all you need to do is go to the UCLA website, click on the links, and you start watching. You know. All right? Uh, and I can only reiterate what I've said before, namely that all these films are available to you until the end of exam week. Um, because if you're going to write a paper on a film, you'll probably need to view it more than once. You'll probably have to view it a couple of times at least. So that's why they're available to you on a continuous basis. All right, so what are the requirements for the class? Um, uh, a short paper, which is going to be due on uh, the Thursday of week five. All right, um, so that's going to be uh, May 3rd. Uh, I will send you by email a reminder about that later on. Secondly, okay, um, and if you look at the syllabus here, it gives you the grade distribution. This paper accounts for 20% of the grade. Uh, you're expected to keep a journal of film entries. Now let me explain to you how this works. It's very simple. You have the option, if you like, of keeping a handwritten journal, but I think the better thing to do, it'll be better for me too, because frankly, I don't have to struggle with the handwriting then in every case. Uh, sometimes that can be a bit of a struggle. Uh, the better thing for you to do, and then of course if you have it on the computer, you can keep on <coughs> excuse me, uh, editing it as, as you please. Uh, but what you want to do is for every film that you watch, so you basically should keep the journal on a weekly basis, you're going to write about 500 words. Um, you can write a lot more than that. I don't have an objection to that. You can write more. If you see a film, you know, and you start writing, um, and you can think about this as a kind of a stream of consciousness, but not really. I want it to be a kind of a deliberately entry, that is you think about it a bit, what, what is it about the film that interests you, um, and you need to, the entry should reflect some interest having to do with the subject matter of the course, right? I mean if you, if you saw the film and you liked the song and you kept on being lyrical and you know about the song and you wrote a thousand words and the song had nothing to do with the intrinsic subject matter, let's say, well that's, it's not really a film entry. The film entry should really be about the film in relationship to the subject matter, but you can write about some other things as well if you like. You know, that, that's, perfectly, that's perfectly fine. So roughly 500 words, which is very little, and you do that for uh, every week if you can. You would submit it to me twice, so you would send, simply send, send it to me as, a, as an email attachment in Word. Uh, please do not send anything in PDF, because if I want to annotate it, make comments, you need to send it to me in Word, okay? You send it to me in Word, um, and uh, I'll read it and, you know, might offer a comment or two, uh, and then you're gonna, so you'll do that on uh, the Thursday of week eight, 
uh, week four, and then again Thursday of week ten. All right. So an entry for each journal, uh, a journal entry for each film. Uh, and so that journal will be 20% of the grade. The paper will be 20%. And then you have a final take-home exam. A take-home exam will be a series of essay questions. Uh, you'll probably get, I reckon, about eight questions, and you'll have to answer four. So you'll have choice. All right, and you're going to basically write. So the, uh, an essay question might be something like, uh, taking into consideration the film called The Legend of Bhagat Singh, uh, w w what can we say about Bhagat Singh uh, uh, you know, and the politics of representation of Bhagat Singh in this film? And in answering this question, take into account the readings by so and so. Just a random you know, essay question. All right, so you get, you get essay questions and you will, you will uh, as I said, answer four of those eight essay questions. You'll have one full week to write the exam, open book exam. You consult any of the readings. Obviously, you know, you can view the films that you have to view. And so if you haven't done, if you haven't seen all the films, then that's a good time to catch up. Um, and that will account for 50%. And then 10% is basically, you know, class participation, attendance. The room is small enough, I know, if someone's not coming at all, then they just show up, you know, week 10. Um, so, um, you know, that's basically 10% is at the instructor's discretion, and that's how the grade is going to be composed. Um, and those are the formal requirements. So one short paper, uh, a journal of film entries, which remember it's not as formal as a paper. You're basically writing something having to do with a film for that week, right? Uh, which you'll submit to me twice, once at the end of the fourth week, once at the end of the tenth week, uh, and then a take on final. Uh, the syllabus, if you haven't looked at, you should because there will be a slight disruption around week nine uh, when I'm going to be in Japan. So. Um, we're going to have a makeup class before that. Uh, we can't do it really after that because that will concentrate too much material in the last, you know, in the last uh, week, um, and that's getting close to the end of the quarter. So we're going to have a kind of an advanced makeup class uh, for uh, the fact that we're missing week nine. Okay, uh, the syllabus is very detailed, very clear. I think. Uh, it also gives you uh, links to a couple of websites. There is a friend and colleague of mine at the University of Iowa who maintains uh, a very large website on Hindi cinema. It's a very good website. I mean, it's remarkably good. Um, uh, his name is Philip Lutkendorf, and, and I would say over half of the films that we're watching, he has, a, has an entry uh, on that Film. So you probably want to, at some point, consult this, this website. Um, I do point out very clearly, uh, please put your cell phones away, okay? Uh, not just off, but just put them out of sight. Um, you know, it, 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 there may be PowerPoint slides. Um, you do not need your cell phone to capture them. Um, sometimes I get that as an argument for why someone is using it. You don't need to do it because I'll put up the PowerPoint slides on the course website. Uh, not every week, and they're not going to be that many, but I'll put them up. The text slides will all be put up, you know, okay? Um, uh, probably at intervals of every three weeks or so. All right? Uh, so no technologies really in the classroom. I've told you about how you can access the films, how you can access uh, the readings, uh, what the requirements are, um, and as far as I can recall, I think that that pretty much covers all the administrative kind of uh, matters. My office hours, one last thing before I move into more substantive matters, office hours are 3.30 to 4.30, Tuesday and Thursday, okay? Um, so um, uh, I, it says that on the syllabus as well, and of course by appointment, and I'm in, in next door in Bunch in room 5240. All right, let me pause for a minute here to ask if anyone has any questions about um, the structure of the course, the requirements, anything of that sort, you know, anything that comes to mind. How many of you here before, let me take a couple of minutes just to get an informal idea, all right? Um, 
How many of you here would describe yourself uh, as uh, fans or aficionados of Bollywood or Indian cinema more broadly? You know, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, about five or six of you. Okay, and uh, how and uh, uh, how many of you here have seen? Let's let me take a film called Lagan because I know that's been viewed by many people. How many of you here have seen? Lagan. So again, roughly about half the class. And how many of you here have seen um, a film uh, uh, which is, I'm seeing where it is on the sil syllabus. My, my, um, my guess would be that not more than one or two of you have seen this one, if that one or two. Dharamputra. Has anybody here seen that? No one has. Okay, so I was... I was quite right in that. You see, so this is, a, this is a, a very small interesting exercise which immediately tells us a few things. Why is it that some films become right, iconic while others fall through the cracks? Because you see, if I had to think of it, let's say, Lagan, by the way, mind you, I'll, my own view is it's, I think it's extraordinarily interesting film, okay? Uh, and unlike some of my, you know, in the circles I move around and it's kind of <laughs> conventional to sort of like, oh, Bollywood, you know, that's for, you know, Bollywood for dummies, kind of. That's how they, some of them think. No, I think, in fact, actually Indian cinema, popular Indian cinema is very complex. And I think one of the reasons it's complex is because it works with mythic material. Mythic material. All right? So uh, let me give you a very simple illustration, Okay so that you understand what I'm trying to say about mythic material. So when I say mythic material, and then I'll give you the illustration, I'm talking about, let's say, in the Indian context, that would include such things as the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. So these are the two big, gigantic epics, right? And it includes all of the material that is called the Puranas. Uh, there are lots of different Puranas. Don't worry if you don't know any of this. Don't worry about it in the least. You'll, you'll see exactly what I mean. Now, so the Mahabharata is, is an epic work. Um, and uh, the Mahabharata was composed over a very long period of time. Uh, it's a gargantuan work, uh, really massive. And there are hundreds of stories within that, within the Mahabharata. There's an overarching story, and then there are stories within that, right? right. So now... Uh, for those of you who've seen Lagan and you know a little bit about the Mahabharata, right? So uh, you know what Lagan is, right? So Lagan is a is a film really about nationalism, where but routed through the whole metaphor of cricket and what cricket meant, uh, and it sets up various kinds of oppositions. Okay, so. If you've seen Lagan and you know a little bit about the Mahabharata, what would be one possible connection right away? How does Lagan draw upon the mythic material called the Mahabharata? Yeah? I saw Lagan a while ago, but is sure. it the, like the gambling aspect in the Mahabharata versus um, them and Lagan, they're playing for... Uh, absolutely on, on target. You, absolutely. You see, it's, gambling is... I would just put in a slight refinement, that's all. Which perhaps you would have anyhow if you kind of thought about it, right? That Lagan is based on an improbable wager. There's a, it begins with an improbable wager. The wager are these country bumpkins who have no idea or clueless about this game. They're, they sort of say, we wager that we're going to beat the hell out of you to these Englishmen who have been born with cricket. Cricket is like part, like apple pie is to America, right? That's what cricket is to England, you know, right? So, and they say, we're going to really, we're going to deliver a, a victory. And of course, the Englishmen are amused. It's an improbable wager, right? Now, you could say that the Mahabharata is based on an improbable wager. I mean, this man, Yudhishthir, is drunk in a similar way in which Bhuvan is drunk. Drunk, I don't mean literally, he's drunk with a certain idea. <coughs> the Im and there, there is an improbable wager too, because eventually what's going to end up happening, right? In the Mahabharata, I mean, uh, the wager takes place. There is a wager, it's a gambling game. And he's going to eventually wager Draupadi. 
the ultimate price. And then, of course, there's this big discussion, huge discussion in the Mahabharata about, about you know, the wager involving Draupadi. Right? Now, you see, le let's be very clear. I am not suggesting to you that I can demonstrate, because you know what, the, if I give this argument, you, you, almost always the response is, what evidence do you have? The scientists particularly love the word evidence. What evidence do you have that the director was thinking this way? I don't have any evidence. And frankly, I don't care. And I think it's actually the wrong question to ask. What evidence is there that the director of Lagan was thinking about the Mahabharata when he made this scene? I don't have any evidence in the ordinary sense of the term. But we have to remember a number of key propositions, which are true not just for films, but are true for all kinds of texts. The author of the text is not the person who decides the interpretation. I, I say that about my own work too, lest you might think that I'm exempting my own work. No. So if somebody here has a very different reading of Divar, well and good. The that is a book that I wrote called Divar. All right? That, th th the person who creates the work puts the work in the public domain, and then you run with the work. Now that doesn't mean that all readings are plausible. There are some readings that are implausible or they're not compelling. You know? So similarly, we would have to say that when I look, when you look at Lagan, now I cannot prove in the ordinary sense of the term that there is a relationship between the improbable wager in the Mahabharata and the wager in Lagan. But there is an association. And I, I know from how the Hindi film is structured, and I'll give you illustrations, that the mythic material is something that every filmmaker in India draws upon. There was this director who passed away many years ago. His name is Manmohan Desai. He made what are called blockbusters. One of the blockbusters he made is a film called Amar Akbar Anthony. All right. I mean, again, you should view it. You know, the, some of these Hindi films are just really uh, marvelous. The way they and the plot is very often chicken feed. I mean, it's really plots are really juvenile quite often. I mean, embarrassingly juvenile actually sometimes. But so Amar Akbar Anthony was, you know, the metaphor for a India that was pluralist and ecumenical. You have a Hindu. You know, uh, Amar Akbar is the Muslim, Anthony is the Christian, you know, solidarity between the three different religions, etc., etc. Uh, so the, the, the guy who made this, his name is Manmohan Desai, he made a, quite a few other films too, uh, which were blockbusters. And he was asked one day, what are your films about? And he unhesitatingly said, all my films are about the Mahabharat. And the interviewer said, really, I don't see any scene from the Mahabharat in any of the films. But of course, one knows exactly what he was saying. But because what he was doing was he was drawing upon this huge mythic material which is available to everyone in India. You know, if you're working in something like cinema. All right. So uh, when we look at these films, we are definitely going to be paying attention to these kinds of considerations. And, and the way, now let me, so let me go back to the syllabus and let me just go through the syllabus with you in some detail um, so that you have a much better understanding not only of the structure of the course, but, but it'll give you some insights into how I'm thinking about the question of nationalism in cinema, all right? So as I mentioned to you, next week, Tuesday lecture, basically give you a overview of Indian nationalism. And then uh, Thursday, we discuss the film Divar. And so you have, you have to have viewed the film before you come and um, read my book. And then there is an Intelligent Critics Guide to Indian Cinema by Ashish Nandi. Uh, and then there are excerpts from a, a, a history of modern India. Uh, so that is the reading that gets paired with his, my lecture on Tuesday, Histories of Indian Nationalism, and gives you a very broad overview of uh, Indian nationalism from approximately the 1880s. Uh, down to independence, time down to 1947. All right. 
Uh, okay, so then we move to week three. Now when we speak about nationalism, first we have to think about a nation and its values. Right? Uh, values is a word that is used very loosely in all kinds of discourse, you know. Um, when Mr. Trump talks about values, the only thing I know, he, he doesn't have any. That I do know. So then you, sometimes you know when, what a value is not uh, by the opposition that it invokes. All right? Um, and of course we know how the word values is used, that the politicians talk about the values they're going to pass down to their children and their children's children, right? And then, you know, each country trumpets certain values. So for example, one of the values that you trumpet here, rightfully or wrongfully, is individualism, right? Uh, I mean, don't forget the phrase Yankee individualism, you know? Uh, we are not supposed to have any individuals in India, uh, according to a certain point of view, because in India all you have is collectivities. You have herds called Hindus, herds called Muslims, herds called Shias, herds called Sikhs, but they're not individuals, according to a certain Western view of India. You know, right? So individualism cannot be a value in that culture, according to this style of reasoning. But clearly, if it's not, there are other values. And I'm not saying, by the way, that I agree that there are no individuals. I'm just saying that that's a Western reading, a certain reading that became predominant. Right? So what are the values? So for example, this film, um, Put Up or Pashtun. And this film is really over the top. Okay? I mean, if, if you, you have to really view it, it's, it's almost hilarious because it's a little garish in a way. It sets up this contrast between a spiritual India and a materialist West. Okay, the character himself is called Bharat, which is a name for India. You know, I mean, how much more obvious can it be, right? Uh, don't look for subtleties, by the way. I mean, we, we, we're not talking here about the films of uh, Ingmar Bergman, you know, uh, or we're not talking about the films of, you know, a really sophisticated filmmaker in the ordinary sense. Okay. What I'm interested in is, how does the filmmaker draw upon the mythic material? What is the idea of India that is being invoked here, and Indian values? How did the filmmaker, and you'll, by the way, you'll see how, how easily the filmmaker falls into this divide, spiritual India, materialist West, and the lecture I will give you um, on uh, Tuesday will will kind of give you the backdrop to that, how that emerged, right? But on the other hand, th these, these films are enormously um, uh, interesting for some of the reasons that I've suggested to you, whatever their shortcomings with respect to, let's say, the plot, all right? Uh, 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 this film is a 1970 film uh, with uh, Manoj Kumar, uh, who's a director of the film as well, and he was, uh, you know, the reigning handsome star of Indian cinema for many years. Uh, and Pura Borpaschim is East and West, so there's that opposition, right? Uh, and again, these categories have to be dissolved, right? Because when you say East and when you say West, well, we kind of roughly, it means, West means Western civilization, East means what? Right? Uh, this is where the problem begins. Right? Because it's east of west, but the Near East, the Far East, India, unless you're going to sort of like all, and if you might, you know, merge it all into one single entity, but of course we know that in this case it's very clearly a commercial Hindi film, so the implication is that everybody knows that east here really refers to a certain kind of Indian you know, landscape, Indian spirituality, so forth and so on, all right? Um, so what are the values that are espoused? And then, so in order to understand that, we have to look at some classical readings by, by some of the major writers of that time, right? who I think were, some of them were extremely astute. And it would be very difficult to suggest that Gandhi or Tagore, two of the people that we are reading, were people who were not subtle in their understanding of what made India perhaps different and what was, if anything, India's mission in the world. Right? So how do they evoke certain kinds of Indian values? And are these only Indian values? Right? For example, if I said to you that 
An Indian value is affection that a parent has for a child. Well, that would seem to be a universal value. But of course, a sociologist or the anthropologist or the psychologist who's studying this might say, yes, but the little difference is that perhaps there is a relationship between the mother and her son which takes a slightly different inflection in India than it does here. Right? Is the mother-son nexus more important in that part of the world? I've heard that argued that there are two cultures of which this is true. The mother-son nexus. Right? It's not that mothers don't have affection for their daughters. Nobody is arguing that. But that there's something different about that relationship. And the two cultures of which I've heard that argued very often are India and Jewish culture. Right? And again, I'm not making a statement of whether I accept it or not. I'm simply saying that we take what is apparently a universal value and then say, but universal values take different inflections in different cultures. And then there might be val so-called values that are actually particular to a certain culture. You know. Right? So this is what we do in week three. We begin with that. Because uh, it's not... You see, this is one of the things that you'll have to keep in mind. We ordinarily say that nationalism produced the nation. There was a nation before there was nationalism. So, so what are the values of a nation? Before we get to the nationalism part, and nationalism is usually taken as a kind of a political movement by most people. I think if I, if I ask you, like, what is an ordinary meaning, you'd say, yeah, you know, like, for example, uh, nationalism is a, the expression of certain kinds of sentiments towards a political end. Right? And we know that nationalism, historically, when we study it, we usually study it as a political movement. So Indian nationalism meant anti-colonial movement against British rule, just as African nationalisms in each case meant a certain kind of resistance to colonial rule, whether the colonial power was Britain or France or Belgium, whatever the case may be. Right? Um, so nationalism and nation, we'd have to also understand them as obviously related terms, but that they, they cannot be viewed as synonymous either. All right. Then week four, woman and the nation. So here we take, and, and the film here is one of the three or four probably most well-known Indian, commercial Indian films called Mother India, um, made in 1957. Um, a little warning beforehand. When you put aside time to watch a Hindi film, don't put aside 90 minutes. Put aside three hours. Okay? Hindi films are long. Right? They're epic in their length. <laughs> All right? So if you, if you think, ah, okay, I'm going to watch a film 90 minutes, you know, in between dinner and something else. No, no, no. You, you, you know, if you really want to watch a Hindi film, be prepared to put aside half a day is what I say, usually. Because, you know, then you need breaks in between, you know, popcorn break, toilet break, this break, that break, whatever. I mean, they can go on. Lagan is three hours and 40 minutes, all right? So, uh, you know, you have to put aside a little bit of time. Um, no such thing as watching a film, Hindi film, without some sense of sacrifice, all right? Uh, woman and the nation, here, all right? Um, speaking of sacrifice, that's what a woman is supposed to do when she embodies a nation, sacrifice for the nation. Right? Well, how did this become naturalized? Right? So that we assume that women really embody the nation. Women speak for the nation. Right? So this film is a film which also looks at such things as a, a course, really, if I were doing it as a two-quarter course, I would have had a separate film, which would have had to do with um, the whole question of development development because if i had to think of one post world war 2 ideology which became universalized it had to be development every country in the global south was on the trajectory of development right you know you develop a nation um, you develop the infrastructure so forth and so on you, you help increase the GNP. 
that, that was the agenda. That was the post-World War II agenda. And this film, Mother India, is largely also a film about development, right? the development of the nation. And particularly a nation had just, that had just been liberated from colonial rule, the project took on you know, a very serious kind of overtone, right? The undertaking was going to be really important because the whole idea was that now a people who had been suppressed for a very long period of time, they now could take matters into their own hands uh, and develop the nation according to the agenda of its own people, not according to the agenda of the elites who had come from England, so forth and so on. And here, again, we are not making any assessment or whether these projects of development were productive in creating emancipatory spaces for people, whether they actually produced equality. Uh, we know there's a substantial literature on uneven development. We know that some elites develop a lot more than others. Uh, and there's, of course, a much more rigorous critique of development, which I'm not even going to enter into at the moment. Uh, you know, of which I myself am a part. I myself have part, you know, uh, been writing on the politics of development for a long time. But this film became a very iconic film. Um, uh, certainly for the 50s and 60s, it was the most iconic film in Hindi cinema. Uh, and you're going to read, and this, the reading here is a little bit different because we do have a couple of pieces which are really explicitly, you know, on the film. Um, um, you know, so in, in beginning with Gayatri Chatterjee's short monograph of which you're reading 30, 40 pages, um, and uh, another piece which is on, on the filmmaker and, you know, what he had in mind. But then you have some broader set of readings. So typically what you'll have is you'll have some readings which will be focused on the film, and then you'll have a broader set of readings which open out the film to wider considerations. All right? So that's what, that's what week four is. Week five is anti-colonial resistance. And we take, our, we take uh, as our main film here, Lagan, which I've spoken to you about uh, before, um, uh, two, 2001. Uh, and uh, this film has generated a substantial amount of critical literature. So we're going to look at some of the debates around Lagan. Uh, the, the, the literature is extraordinarily interesting, actually. It's really very interesting because uh, there were some critics who many thought were being overly sophisticated in their critique of it. That, you know, uh, there's a sort of, there's a liberal view, there's a kind of a left view of it. Uh, then there are those who, who took the view that this film was actually much more complex, that it wasn't some kind of knee-jerk uh, you know, nationalism. Uh, dis, uh, so for those who have seen it, you know that, that different constituencies seem to be represented. If you look at the composition of that cricket team, right? So you have a Dalit, you have a Muslim, you have a person who's handicapped, you know, you name it, right? Uh, the, 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 you know, there seems to be like, so is this like American multiculturalism planted onto Indian, uh, the Indian scene? Somebody might ask. Right? Uh, is that what was really happening? I don't think so. I don't think that this was a case where the filmmaker simply said, well, I'm going to offer an inclusive view and I'm going to make sure that my cricket team has representatives from each constituency and, and community. But you can see the perils of doing it the way he, that, that it opens itself up to that kind of attack, that he's simply making these accommodations uh, ah, and then we might have to study, if we look at the relations between different members there, we might have to see if there are certain hierarchies that emerge there, you know, right? So forth and so on. But, but, but we shouldn't lose uh, sight of the fact that this film is a film really about anti-colonial resistance, you know? Um, and why cricket? Why cricket? So this film is, is uh, really quite... If, I mean, in some ways, it's a linchpin because if you had to say that there were two, two passions that animate many Indians, those two would have to be cinema and cricket, unquestionably. 
And what could be better than a film that brings both of them together? Right? Okay? And Lagan, appropriately enough, is a film that's as long as a cricket game, if I may put it this way. You know, cricket is a very unusual game. And we need to pause for a couple of minutes. Because from here we can extrapolate extraordinary things about what makes India so different, let's say, from the US. All right? So cricket, what is cricket? Has anybody here ever played cricket? OK. So uh, let me rephrase the question. Because I don't want to take the time to describe the whole game. <laughs> Except to say this, that a cricket match the traditional form of it, which is called a test match, the traditional form of it can take place over five days, actually six days, because you had a day of break in between. Okay, So it could go up to six days, and at the end of it, guess what? It could end in a draw. A draw. Now, do you think that's possible in America? You shook your head emphatically saying, no, it's not. Why is it not? And what might be the implications of that? Uh, well, I mean, every successful American sport is centered around your ability to monetize it or use it as a vehicle for advertisement, it seems. OK, but that's bringing in a different consideration, which is important. I agree. That is that the market has come into it. So I mean, and that's true, by the way, of college basketball, too. I know we just went through so-called March Madness. and. You know, it's all very funny. This country is so different than any other country. Marsh Madness, you think it's about something really critical. It's about a bunch of blokes shooting a few balls down some hoops, and the whole country is, you know, uh, going berserk. And Marsh Madness, you know, and then, you know, the, the, I, by the way, I know because I used to follow basketball for years. I don't anymore. Now I don't follow any sport because they're all just money-making enterprises, frankly. But I mean, I know all about the brackets, the 64, and I know that Warren Buffett had offered $2 million to someone, I think it was a year before last, who would be able to get all the 64 slots right, and then all the way until the finals. And of course, no one's ever been able to do it. And we know that this year, a team called Loyola Marymount had Sister Jean, right? Uh, right? Uh, so so I, I know what's happening. It's not as though I don't know that. But what I find interesting is, that you're right, that this uh, has to do with capitalism and all of that. But, but let's take a step back. What is the first thing about American sports that's different from cricket? Because look, it's been, cricket has also been marketized and monetized. You know the cricket players today, Today, the top players in India receive salaries equivalent, salaries, I'm not talking about endorsements, receive salaries equivalent to $5 million annually. Yes, the top ones. Like the, the person who heads the Indian cricket team, a man, man by the name of Virat Kohli, that's his salary. Okay? And I, I remember when I was growing up, a cricket, the captain of the test team made about... 300 US dollars. And all of them had full-time jobs working as bank clerks or something else, and cricket is something you did on the side. So you're, you're on the dot, but, but there's something else before that. What makes every, I think you had your hands up. It's about winning and losing, ah, so you have to win. Okay, all right. So can you have an American sport that does not have a conclusive finish. Meaning someone is established as a winner and if you're a winner then it means there's someone called a loser, right? right? We know how much contempt the person sitting in the White House has for losers, right? Okay, right? A winner and a loser. If you, you watch an NBA game, you watch an NFL game, what happens? At, if at the end of regulation time it's a tie, what do you have to do? You go into overtime. You go into double overtime, triple overtime. You have to have a conclusive end. That's a monumental difference between the culture of cricket and American sports. Because then we're going to have to try to understand 
why is it that this idea of a winner and loser is so critical to the American consciousness and way of thinking and how America organizes itself as a society? Because now let's ex take a different analogy. When you have a draw, it's like saying that two of you came to me with opposing views and at, the end of, and at the end of having heard both of you out, I said, well, I think it's a draw between the two of you. I, I'm convinced by some things you've said and I'm convinced by some things you've said. But I'm not wholly convinced by either one of you. And I'm not wholly not convinced by either of you. Right? But, so it's kind of a, a draw. It's a tie. What is the word in English? Ambiguity. Ambiguity. Now I think American culture is completely hostile to ambiguity. I'm going to make, I'm willing to make that argument and write a whole book just on that. That American culture is actually hostile to ambiguity. When, when Mr. Bush, okay, went to war after September 11th bombings, he said you're either with us or you're against us. Well why should you be either? What, what if you were among those who thought that, yes, I think the September 11th bombings are a dastardly, cowardly act, but what if you thought that, yeah, but America's actually a big player in instigating trouble all over the world? There are lots of people who would take that argument, that U.S. foreign policy, foreign policy is not innocent. Let's look at what the Americans have done all over the world. I mean, when I hear everybody crying themselves hoarse today among the Democrats about how Putin might have, right, tampered with the American elections, you know how many countries the United States has tampered with in their elections? I mean, it'll take, it'll take me a whole day to go over the history of how the U.S. has tampered with the elections in at least 50 countries. At least 50 countries. Not to mention the fact that they simply intervened to throw out people completely from power. Right? I mean, so what is this whole thing about, oh, just, you know, they tampered, well, maybe, maybe they did, and maybe it's not such a bad idea, I might say, you know? Right? We have to think politically about what is really going on here. Right? So why am, now why am I taking that as an instance? Because I'm trying to suggest to you, right, that we have to understand, going back to Bush, that he cannot tolerate ambiguity. Everything has to be black and white. You see? Now I think this is the fundamental thing about cricket. That cricket is a game of ambiguity. Right? It's, so we have to, and therefore this now gives us a, a peg into nationalism that there were certain kinds of ambiguity also, by the way, about the project of nationalism. And that the most interesting writers, such as Tagore and Gandhi, always had that ambiguity about nationalism. And of course, then the, there's a kind of a, 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 a contradiction at source in Lagan that, if, that cricket itself is a metaphor really for ambiguity, but Lagan does not end with, the, with uh, a draw. You know? Of course it doesn't. But the reason it doesn't is because it has a political project. That political project is nationalism, anti-colonial resistance, so forth and so on. So you see what I'm saying is there's an inherent ambiguity within the structure of the film, given that it's playing upon the very metaphor of a game that in fact does not lend itself to easy wins and easy draws. And you know what, and this is where the market comes in now, you're absolutely right, because what's happened in the last three decades is they have modified cricket to come up with different versions. So now you have three versions, you have the test version, which is still played, by the way. And if anyone here has not read today's New York Times, okay, go and read it. Today's New York Times. Why? Because the captain of the Australian cricket team, Stephen Smith, was found tampering with a ball. It is the biggest news in Australia. The biggest news. I can't tell you how big it is in Australia. And so he's had to resign in disgrace. Yesterday's New York Times had an article as well, giving a press conference. He's literally crying. You can see that. You know? I mean, this guy was like the national hero. 
and and now they're saying well maybe we maybe we overestimated to what extent we believed in the idea of fair play in australia because he, this because the problem with stephen smith is that he has ruined this whole reputation of cricket as a game of fair play so forth and so on right it's really quite astonishing what's what's going on there right but you see that you see how i'm drawing the connections here because what am i trying to do i'm trying to suggest to you that um when we look at Lagan, we're going to have to try to consider a much wider range of questions. And the film becomes an insight not just into cricket and into Indian nationalism, but it becomes an insight into America. Right? What makes America really different? You know? Why is there a kind of an intolerance for? Ambiguity. Why is there an intolerance for, lo for, for things that don't end decisively? Right? Because I would say in this culture it's better to be a loser than to be in limbo. That is, you're neither here nor there. You know? I mean, this is what T.S. Eliot, the great poet, had always argued, you know, that, you know, either be in heaven or in hell, but be somewhere. You know, so uh, this is what we're going to try to do with these films. We want to try to parse them and read them in slightly different ways. All right, week six: revolutionaries and the comradely feeling. So when I talk about revolutionaries, I'm talking about people who thought of themselves as revolutionaries. Now this will make more meaning to you when I dis when I tell you very simply without qualifying it at this point. But the person who was the public face of India to the rest of the world was who? From India. Who was the man who was the public face of India to the rest of the world? Gandhi. Without a shadow of a doubt. Without a shadow of a doubt. If there was one Indian who had been universalized. You know? Whose name was known everywhere. <coughs> I mean, I know people who came to this country from India as graduate students in the late 1960s. And the first thing they tell me is that when they came here, all they had to say was they were from the land of Gandhi and doors would open for them. Ah, Gandhi, the saint, you know, the prophet of nonviolence. And of course, this was now late 60s. This was already after the civil rights movement because all the civil rights leaders knew, had read Gandhi, had followed his strategies, you know, Martin Luther King, by Rustin James Farmer, you name it, you know, right? Uh, but Gandhi's name had cultural capital. Now in India itself, there's a large segment of opinion which has always held the view that, that he was never a real revolutionary. You know, he was just a bourgeois leader of a bourgeois organization. That's the view that some Indians have had. They think that the real revolutionary was somebody like Bhagat Singh, whose name I wrote, you know. All right, so we, so we want to look at that literature. We want to look at some other scholarly literature on that. And then we want to look at one film called Rangde Basanti. So that's a film. So for every week, remember, there's one film that you have to watch. And that's our primary film. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll screen excerpts from another film. OK, so in this case, for example, there's a film called The Legend of Bhagat Singh. There have been lots of films made about Bhagat Singh. In fact, more films that have been made on him than on Gandhi, you know, all right? Um, and now I've already described to you how we pair the films with certain readings, right? So that's what we do over here. Uh, good time for me to mention that if you look at the syllabus, you'll see very often at the end of each week, you'll see optional supplementary reading. That's exactly what it is. You're, it's not required reading. But if you get interested in that subject, you know, here's another reference for you, another reading that you can do. So that's optional supplementary reading. It's not required in the least. And you're not responsible for it. That's the main thing. You know, okay? Week seven, communalism. What is communalism? It's, we're going to have a lengthy discussion of it. But it's nationalism that's derailed. Nationalism that goes into what is called false consciousness, using an old Marxist paradigm here. You know, right? That in, so very briefly, in the Indian context, what would it mean? That Hindus and Muslims, for example, instead of viewing the British as their common foe, they begin to view each other as their foe. Right? So religious animosity rising to the fore. 
that's what in a nutshell you could describe as communalism. So there we have a film called Dharamputra, literally the son of religion, 1961. The director of this film is the same man who made the film Divar, which you see for next week, uh, 1975 film. Um, but you're going to have to, you're going to need a real understanding of communalism. So there's a lecture which is devoted to that subject. What is communalism, May 15th? Um, and then we're going to look, obviously, at this film, what insights it gives us into this question of religion. What re role does religion play? And in fact, I don't have time to really sort of elaborate on all the subtleties here, but even the word religion, I am going to suggest to you, you should always think what we mean, religion. You know, so if you look at, let's say, a dictionary of Sanskrit, you know, the, the, the language from which many modern North Indian languages are derived, right? So the ancient language. Um, and you say, okay, what's the word for religion? So what's the word for religion for those of you who know Hindi, Sanskrit, something? Dharam. Okay. Does, it, does dharam have other meanings too? So for example, there's a class of books called the Dharam Shastras or the Dharma Shastras that's translated as law books, right? Order. And it means conduct, good conduct, good law, behavior, right? How did it come to mean religion if it ever did is a question I would ask. I don't believe that there's actually a word in any of these Indian languages that translates into religion. You know? Because as I said, if you look up the Sanskrit dictionary for dharam, the entry will give you dozens, dozens of meanings. What about being? Yes, but that comes in through the Islamic influence, right? So the, the question was, you're right, okay? Mazhab also maybe, right? Mazhab would be the other word, but in Sanskritic languages, what is the word? We don't really have a word, I would argue. And it has been argued by some scholars, this is where it's a matter is very complicated, but and as I said, I'm not going to elaborate upon it right now. But some scholars have argued that in fact, every so-called religion in the world today is really just a Protestant form of that so-called religion. Meaning that every religion got Protestantized beginning in the late 18th, early 19th century. That Hinduism was remade in the model of Protestant Christianity, Buddhism was remade, Judaism, all of them were remade in the image of something called Protestant Christianity. There was only one religion, and that was Protestant Christianity. And then everything else became a, had to tailor themselves to becoming a religion. All right? Now, I don't expect you to necessarily comprehend all the implications of that. But what we are saying here is that when we look at something called communalism, um, we're, we're talking about some domain that we call religion, you see, okay, roughly. Uh, and the problem here always has to do with how do we transport and translate categories from one culture to another. All right, that's what I'm alerting you to. Because some, some things are portable, some theories are portable, some phenomena are portable, and some are not. All right? Let's take an illustration. Uh, I mean, this is an extraordinarily critical point. You don't have to, again, don't worry if you don't follow it throughout. Take something called the novel. Okay, we know that novel is a genre of writing. Where did the novel originate? It originated in Western Europe. 
as a genre of writing. Okay? Now, what's interesting is that in every Indian language that I know of, and I'm certain this is true of Chinese and Japanese and Korean and host of other languages, that people started writing novel, the novels. Okay, They started writing novels. So it was very portable. Meaning that the novel is a form that begins here, it's portable, you can carry it. Okay? But it's portable in a very different way than Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is very portable. You can find it everywhere, so to speak. But you can't do much with it. Coca-Cola is Coca-Cola whether you drink it in Sudan or Congo or LA or New York or Fiji. I, I know from my childhood that we did a few things in it that people would be would think bizarre here because you know in India what happens is all these drinks they lose their fizz very quickly you know so you know you we would add a little bit salt because immediately the bubbles would rise up you know when we were young you get a lot more fizz out of it just like you do when you open a bottle of sparkling water you know right in India it loses its fizz very quickly so to get more because that was part of the thrill the carbonated right right so you we actually used to put salt but you know barring a slight modification of that kind coca-cola is coca-cola everywhere you right it's both are portable the novel is portable coca-cola is portable but they're not portable in the same way why because you can't do much with coca-cola it's going to be the same thing no matter where it is the novel is not the same thing it's a form that starts here, but takes very different forms as it moves across the world. And what people did with the novel in, in India, writing in the English language, is something very different, for example, than what was done over here. Or what you might do with it, writing a novel in Chinese or Norwegian or whatever the case might be, you see. Right? So there are certain things that are portable and some that are not and then there are some things that are portable in a predictable way and some that are portable in a way that is not so predictable. Right? Okay, so uh, when we think therefore of nationalism and religion in both cases we are speaking about, because you might think where is all this going, but here's a link. We are speaking about two phenomena that have been portable. Nationalism and religion. Where did nationalism start? It starts in the Western Hemisphere. It starts in the Western Hemisphere. I mean, don't forget, you know, that you have the American Revolution as it's called, right? The War of Declaration of Independence. What was that? It was an assertion of nationalism, right? You have the French Revolution, you have the Haitian Revolution. It started in the Western Hemisphere and then gradually it moves. And by the 20th century, nationalism has taken all over. Now it's reared its ugly head all over the world again. That's what you're seeing in the US, that's what you're seeing in Russia, in Turkey, in India, in China basically all authoritarian states now, fundamentally, in many ways, with authoritarian leaders. The Philippines, Hungary, right? The strong man, as they're, as they're called. Right? So these are portable phenomena. Then we get Gandhi. Bourgeois or not, you cannot do a course on nationalism and cinema and not deal with Gandhi. I mean, let's just, we have to accept that. And there has been an interesting body of cinematic work. This film, Lagi Rao Munabai, I don't know if anyone here has seen it, is really quite a film. It, all right, and, we, and we're going to have to spend a little bit of time on it. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's got this clownish figure, <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, the film itself is actually quite, uh, quite a foray into Gandhi and public consciousness and Gandhi and public culture, you know, and all of that. 
Uh, and then I'm sorry I'm burdening you with my a uh, lot of my readings because I've been writing on him for a while, uh, including one on moving images of Gandhi. Um, so we got you know a few readings there, and then we have the nation, the other, and terrorism, the Kashmir problem. Uh, Kashmir is figuring in a lot of Hindi films in the last two three decades. <coughs> um, I will just mention a fact to you without elaborating upon it, just so that you can begin to think about it. Do you know that the word Pakistan, even when Hindi films were really talking about something called Pakistan, they never used the word for decades. You cannot watch, you could not watch a Hindi film which was clearly about Pakistan, but you never used the word. Pakistan, never. Right? Interesting. Why? What are the implications? Right? That's worthwhile thinking about. Now, Kashmir. It, it's there. Of course, we had the, what's called kind of the intifada in Kashmir, and then you've had iterations of it, as is the case with Palestine. Oh, I need to wind up in a couple of minutes quickly now, but. Uh, Kashmir has become a major um, focal point uh, for the Hindi film. And so I want to try to see what is the politics of representation of Kashmir over there. And we're going to actually view a excerpt as well from a much older film, which has a kind of idyllic vision, because Kashmir was always an idyllic place, uh, all right? Um, often described as the most beautiful place in the world. Um, by many people who have been who have been to it, and then finally conclude we conclude with India and the nation state of Pakistan, right? So, um, how does the Hindi film? Because after all, I mean that is the closest entity to India um, that people in India may have to think about. Uh, I think more Indians think about America than they think about Pakistan actually uh, easily. Uh, We'd have to understand why that's the case. Um, but important thing is that, again, that there is a kind of a body of work that has emerged in recent years. Uh, this film is, uh, again, directed by Yash Chopra, by the way. So this is the third film by him that we're seeing. And it gives you a time span for his career. Um, and this is, you know, ultimately, last comment, really. Uh, not meant to really be an endorsement or anything. It's just simply a way of thinking. I think uh, Bollywood remains very, uh, is very popular all over the world in part because it is in some ways the last space for romanticism. You know, the Veer Zara is a very romantic film. You know, it's a, you know, when you do the kind of work I do, you become very cynical and jaded about such things as romanticism, you know. Uh, but this is the kind of film that makes you want to believe in it, right? And of course, this is precisely why it can become a film that might preclude you from really taking a good look because you get so dazzled by the kind, taken in by the kind of romanticism of the film. A film that looks very lyrically at the possibilities of, you know, the border kind of collapsing between India and Pakistan. You know, what could be more charming than, you know, a man from Pakistan, a woman from India, or vice versa, falling in love. You know, all the cliches, right, come together. Love resolves all of, all of the world's problems, really. Uh, but yeah, that's seems to be if you did the kind of romantic reading. It really is a space, I think, for a kind of a non-cynical romanticism that's left. And I think that that's one of its attractions. And this is one of the most sophisticated examples of that. You know? So this is where we wind up with. All right? OK, so just a reminder, no class on Thursday. And I'll see you a week from today. <laughs>